Board games allow for families and or friends to get together and compete in fun challenges, although thanks to video games it's become possible for people to enjoy these games without the need for a physical board. Numerous video games have been created with the intent of transferring the format of board games to a digital setting. The Wii Party series has successfully done this, as have the Mario Party titles, where players roam around digital boards themed around areas within the Mushroom Kingdom in order to obtain more stars and coins than their rivals. Certain titles even exist which, rather than containing virtual board games developed specifically for them, instead mimic the appearances and functions of actual board games such as Monopoly and Clue. The latter of these video games, while enjoyable, are simply copies of their physical counterparts, though the former, while also enjoyable, do at times stray quite far from the defining features expected of tabletop games. There does exist, however, a virtual board game which, while being exclusive to electronic consoles, contains gameplay that is stunningly similar to that of an actual board game. This title, which released for the Nintendo Wii in 2011, is known as Fortune Street in North America. America, Itadaki Street in Japan, and Boom Street in PAL regions. The Itadaki Street series actually began in 1991, but Fortune Street in particular was the first installment to be released in North America. In many ways, Fortune Street is similar to series such as Mario Party, involving games in which four players move around boards in order to gain the most wealth. In fact, half of the title's characters and boards are taken from Super Mario's franchise, with the other half coming from Dragon Quest. What differentiates Fortune Street from a Mario Party game such as Mario Party Superstars is how the title's complexity is obtained. The latter title is complex thanks to its inclusion of dozens of uniquely fictitious minigames and events, and while Fortune Street is by no means more realistic in its appearance, this title, developed by Square Enix, gained its complexity thanks to its focus on more realistic gameplay, involving mundane activities like running businesses and paying taxes. Of course, this comparison wasn't made with the intent of making one title seem super superior over the other, as both Mario Party and Itadaki Street are equally enjoyable video game series, but regardless, it's quite notable that Square Enix has been able to conjure up such a complex yet welcoming game while utilizing mechanics similar, at least in some ways, to the workings of an actual economy. As previously mentioned, Fortune Street is, at least fundamentally, very similar to Mario Party. Once a game is initiated, turn order is decided randomly and players proceed to move around a board by rolling dice. Some of the title's boards are very simple, having relatively linear layouts, while others allow for navigational freedom and at times will even morph in the middle of a game. The main goal of Fortune Street is also similar to that of Mario Party titles, except rather than collecting the greatest amount of stars in a set number of turns, players must compete indefinitely until either an individual reaches a specific net worth or goes bankrupt. Increasing one's net worth is the aim of the game, and the process of doing so can be expedited through the collecting of a full set of suits scattered around a board and reaching a bank space, which grants a promotion and the purchasing of properties and stocks using ready cash. Through the accumulating of net worth and cautious use of ready cash, players must grow in wealth while preventing others from doing the same. This is Fortune Street at its most basic, and while it may take some practice, the game is one that everyone can adjust to quickly. Even as a child, I was able to understand enough about Fortune Street to play the game with some competence. However, Fortune Street hides layers of additional mechanics which, when understood, allow for numerous different playstyles to unfold. Of course, the primary strategy for making money in Fortune Street involves purchasing properties in order to charge payments to other players who land on them. This simplistic concept alone has a few additional mechanics to be learned about. Firstly, if a player lands on a property that they own, rather than having to pay themselves, which would be quite redundant, said player is given the opportunity to invest ready cash into any of their existing properties in order to raise their prices, provided the shop they upgrade hasn't yet reached its max capital. This sprucing up mechanic allows for players to strategically raise the prices of shops which are in convenient locations in order to make even more money. While most properties in Fortune Street take the form of a normal shop, players can choose to have their boards littered with vacant plots as well. These squares, when purchased, allow players to build different structures upon them, but no more than three of the same structure can exist at any given time. The first and most consistently rewarding option to create on a 
semi-vacant plot is the checkpoint, which acts similarly to a toll booth, forcing players to pay a steadily rising toll for each successive passage through it, whether they land directly on its space or not. Circuses can also be built, which function similarly to shops, except when expanded are set to fixed costs. Balloon ports allow their owners to travel to any square on the board free of cost, tax offices force players who land on them to pay a price determined entirely by their own net worth, and homes grant their owners the ability to forcibly congregate all other players to the home. An estate agency, when confronted by a player who doesn't own it, forces that player to close their properties for a turn, but when landed on by its owner, allows that player to purchase any currently unowned shop. And lastly, a three-star shop is precisely what its name makes it out to be, a shop that, when opened, already boasts a considerably high price. These vacant plots allow for players to develop individualized strategies that can be hard to predict, and can even be renovated in order to keep players on their toes. Adding another layer of complexity to Fortune Street's property purchasing mechanic is the implementation of districts. Property spaces on any given board are lined with a bright, vivid border, with the color of said border representing that property's respective district. These districts are notable because, if a single player purchases a shop belonging to a district in which they already own a store, both properties will gain an upgrade in price. By monopolizing districts, individual players can greatly increase the threat of their properties, not solely by raising their prices, but also their max capital, meaning that they can be invested in even further. This gives players not only an incentive to purchase properties that share districts, but to also block others from gaining their own monopolies by purchasing a shop another player is trying to get their hands on. This race for the most beneficial properties can lead to trade deals between players with the aim of acquiring mutual benefits, or in more dire cases, property buyouts. As if the game weren't complex enough, Fortune Street, as previously iterated, also allows players to buy and sell stocks. Upon reaching a bank or stockbroker square, or obtaining specific venture cards, which will be discussed soon, players can invest in stocks which are linked to districts. When money is invested into a district in which a player owns stock, either through sales, investments, or more stock purchases, said player will receive dividends proportionate to the amount of stock they own. Stocks can not only be valuable tools for making money off of one's own investments and the investments of others, but can also be used as insurance, and can be readily sold when a player runs low on ready cash. It's because of all of these mechanics that Fortune Street is able to take a concept that fundamentally is so similar to Mario Parties, and make of it a game which allows for highly individualized strategies focused around the buying and selling of numerous assets. Now that all of the more formal aspects of Fortune Street have been discussed, let's talk about some of the board squares that more distinctly resemble mechanics present in Mario Party. Aside from all of the squares which contain properties, stock markets, and banks, many squares also exist which can heighten or detriment players' chances of succeeding in ways more indirect than affecting their net worth. Just as Mario Party has had happening and event spaces in its installments, which evoke a number of peculiar occurrences, suit and venture squares allow for similar levels of madness to occur. Upon landing on one of these squares, players are able to choose a venture card. Aside from granting cash when chosen consecutively in rows, venture cards can cause any number of events, ranging from a player's wallet turning defective to Lakitu spawning with the sole purpose of closing any shop he comes across. Venture cards can bring with them many unpredictable and sometimes undesirable effects, with some being permanent and others temporary. Boon squares also exist, which for a turn grant players who land on them a 20% commission on all profits made, as do boom squares, which have the same effect but with a greater 50% commission. These squares are quite useful towards the end of a game when many properties have grown considerably in price. Take a break squares act as their name implies, forcing those who land on them to close all of their properties for a turn, and roll on squares allow players another opportunity to roll a die and move even further. There are also a number of unique squares that simply serve the purpose of moving players around boards in various ways, with Backstreet, One Way Alley, and Magmalis squares transporting players from one set destination to another. Lifts present on Yoshi's Island do this as well, but only travel in one direction, not providing a route back to their initial destination. Switches, while not directly altering players' locations, do allow for board layouts to be rearranged when landed on, and cannons allow players who meet them to travel to any square occupied by another player at the time. The final unique square, which is very functionally similar to minigames from Mario Party, is the Arcade Square, which when encountered, initiates one of four basic games.
games. Three of these games can only be played by the player who visits the arcade, with Round the Blocks and Memory Block benefiting only said player, and Dart of Gold, while a single player game, being capable of rewarding any competitor. The fourth game, Slurpadrome, allows every player to compete by choosing a slime of their choice and watching as their chosen slime races the others to a finish line. All of these games can gift rewards ranging from warps or ready cash to free property expansions. And so, while the arcade is not always a priority, landing on its square could prove to be a beneficial action if possible. With their varying levels of usefulness and differing effects, these squares help to add a degree of unpredictability to Fortune Street's otherwise calculated mathematics-based gameplay. Though having a somewhat limited audience, and reasonably so, as not everyone wants math and business incorporated into their video games, Fortune Street provides a very fun and engaging experience to those who take kindly to its mechanics. A vaguely economized rendition of Mario Party is interesting enough on its own, with investments and promotions coming into play, but what truly pushes Fortune Street beyond merely being a more complicated version of Virtual Monopoly is the game's implementation of stocks, vacant plots, monopolies, venture cards, and many other gimmicks which allow for different players to craft their own playstyles comprised of different strategies. Strategies. Some players may rely on investing most of their money into shops that players travel past frequently in order to make money off of sales, while others may steer away from relying on others and invest into their own districts in order to make money off of dividends with each investment they make. If you're like my annoying friend, you may choose to purchase all of the vacant plots in order to build as many balloon ports as possible, in order to fly to suit squares and gain promotions very quickly. Players are free to form their individualized strategies and make changes to them as needed, allowing for impressively variable gameplay. Something I've neglected to mention is that Fortune Street also includes easy rules, a playstyle which disincludes stocks, vacant plots, and districts, allowing players new to Fortune Street a chance to adjust to the game's basic workings. All of these mechanics, complete with the addition of numerous recognizable video game characters and locations, makes Fortune Street a game that I'd love to see return to a Nintendo console. Thank you all so much for watching.